Hello, and welcome to another episode of our Outlier Investor Series, where we dig into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies used by world-renowned investors across public and private markets. I'm Daniel Scribner, and on the show today, I'm joined by Ben Blumenrose, co-director and managing partner of Designer Fund, which is an early-stage venture capital firm that backs founders that both recognize the power of design and are committed to getting design right from day one. Designer Fund was founded by Ben Blumenrose and Enrique Allen in 2012, after the two met at a program put on by Stanford's D School, where students use design to develop their own creative potential. When Ben and Enrique founded Designer Fund, there were few companies in Silicon Valley outside of Apple that understood the power of design to build incredible products, create a category-defining brand, and ultimately forge an enduring company. There were also no other venture capitalists with a pure design background. And yet, over the last decade, Designer Fund has built an incredible venture firm. They've produced top quartile returns for their investors, beating out almost all of their peers in the market, and were early investors in a wave of design-centric companies that have defined the last 10 years, including Stripe and Gusto. In today's episode, you'll learn why design is essential to creating great products that delight customers. Products that don't just check a box, but that set a new standard and aim to improve some aspect of their customers' lives. The role that design plays in developing, sharing, and executing a shared vision, including why designer founders are some of the world's best storytellers, how companies like Airbnb have made design a strategic focus and given design a seat at the table when it comes to making decisions at the highest levels. We talk about what separates the companies that get design right from those that get it wrong. We break down designer funds investment process and decode the algorithm they use to make investment decisions, including how designer fund has redesigned the way venture is done and created a rigid process to help them make the highest quality decisions. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a ton more. You can find the show notes and text transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 131. That's outlieracademy.com slash 131. And you can learn more about Designer Fund at designerfund.com or by following Designer Fund on Twitter. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Ben Blumenrose of Designer Fund. Ben Blumenrose, thank you so much for joining me on Outlier Academy as part of our Outlier Investor Series. Uh, I'm thrilled to have you on. <laughs> Excited to be on. So we're going to focus today on Designer Fund, which is a venture fund um, built around really the idea of kind of getting design in venture-backed startups uh, from day one. Um, and you've been working on this for about 10 years. Where I'd love to start, we've got a lot of ground to cover, is if you could just give people a quick sketch of your background and kind of leading up to and before founding Designer Fund. Sure, yeah. So, so yeah, my, oh man, yeah, where, to, where to start? <laughs> you got to go back in time. Crank up the yeah, I'm trying to how, how far back to go. So yeah, my, my background is historically in fine art. So I, I started uh, being, you know, I'm 43. So computers, when I was, when I was a kid, it was like the Apple IIc. So the, the idea of like design wasn't even in the, the thing that we, we thought about, right? So I was just the kid that always drew and painted uh, in the back of the class and just kind of spent all my time doing that. And then all of a sudden, like the Apple II, the Mac came out. And I got obsessed with, with that. I got obsessed with the idea of like art on computers. And, um, and the, 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 the moment where design all of a sudden became a thing is I, I used to, on the Mac, I used to like modify so software all the time. And as a 13 year old, you know, go and res edit and start like modifying uh, the way the software looked. And, and I thought that was the coolest thing. And then I used to be on BBSs and talking to folks. And when, as a 13 year old, uh, I, there was an ad agency that reached out to me. They had no idea how old I was. They just saw that I was modding these these games, and they said, "Hey, uh, we have this client. Um, they want to uh, uh, modify this game." To uh, the, the the client was Zima, if you remember the that clear uh, mm -hmm. alcoholic beverage. So yeah, they're reaching out to a thirteen year old, asking them to modify a game to be Zima centric. It was asteroids. And they wanted it to have like a six pack as the big asteroid, a, a single bottle. <laughs> Dear God. And, <laughs> Dear God, and, and a bottle cap, right? And all done in 3D. Uh, I used to do a lot of little, little like 3D experiments. Whatever. And they said, we don't have much of a budget. We have five grand. We can pay five grand. As a 13-year-old in uh, whatever it was, 1990, uh, 1990 or that was... And un, that was basically retirement money. Yeah, that's $15,000 in today's dollars. That was, yeah, and <laughs> so if, with inflation today, it's a 1.8 million, right? So someone's <laughs> paying you 1.8 million to do these graphics. 
And that was the moment for me where I was like, oh my God, this is like a thing. This is like a thing I can make money on. Computer art is a thing I can make money on. And I got obsessed with it. Uh, went to study design at UCLA. When it had all the, I've had every kind of design role you can imagine. I'm freelance as a designer. I've worked in-house at design agencies. I've, uh, you know, I've done it all really. So when I talk to designers, it's like whatever stage of their career, I'm like, I have been there. I have, I have <laughs> done what you're doing so I can speak to it. But really the, the, uh, the experience that opened my eyes to the power of design and design and scale is Facebook. So I, uh, in the summer of 2006, I get a call from a, and I was starting my own company at the time with a friend that actually became a very big company called Magento Commerce. Um, so I was starting that with a friend of mine. And, uh, and, and I got a call from a friend of a friend. They worked in Palo Alto. Would I come up and meet the team? And they were a social network. And all I knew about the social network was that we had two interns. And every time I would turn my head, they would be on the site. On the site. I'm just like, hey, stop going on that site. Like, do your work, right? Uh, and I was just so intrigued. I was like, so curious, like, what is the deal with this company? And so, so I went to visit Facebook when it was, when I first visited, it must've been about a hundred people, you know, maybe three, four designers and whatever, 20, 25 engineers. And when I went up there, I said to myself, there is a, and, and I told them this, I said, there is a 0.0001% chance of me joining. It's so abysmally low because I lived in LA at the time. And I just said, there's no way I'm joining your company. It's so low, but I'm just kind of curious to meet you all. And I'm, I, I know people use this thing. So they, they, they said, oh yeah, we'll take that. And so they flew me up um, and, I, and I just drank. It was, it was a weekend where I didn't even realize it was an interview. And I flew back down to LA after the week and I just said, oh, okay, this is where everyone who's really good, like amazing engineers, like people who want to change the world, like this is, the, this is what Silicon Valley, like I didn't really know anything about Silicon Valley, any of that stuff. So that was the thing that opened my eyes to all of a sudden, like this idea of product design, design at scale, design, design making, changing the world, like all the stuff that I had dreamed of, all of a sudden it was actually getting manifested here. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the, the, the experience that really just like, you know, kind of changed my life trajectory. I got to meet amazing people, work alongside all these amazing people. And basically we started Designer Fund, you know, I, and my plan was to stay there 15, 20 years. Like I was like, I don't, this, I remember in 2010, I, I sat there and I looked around the office with so much, like we were just, the company was doing well. The people were amazing. And, and I remember there was a day I just sat there and I looked around and I said, this is it. Like, I won't ever look for work again. Like as long as I keep doing what I'm doing, I don't need to find, like I'm done. And it was such an, a crazy feeling to feel like I'm done with this like rat race of finding jobs. I no longer need to look for new jobs because like, I found the last job I would ever want. And it was amazing. It was the most content I felt. I, I, I have not felt that content with work <laughs> since then. Like a designer fund, it's so you hard. You had a to peak moment content. like a decade or more ago at this point. <laughs> I, yeah, I, in terms of just like feeling like this is it and there's nothing more I need, um, that was it. And then, um, and then basically a couple of years later is when the cracks started to show up, which is just like so many people started reaching, you know, Facebook success created this giant magnifying glass from the people that work there and people started reaching out for help on design. And it really opened my eyes to, the, to how absent design was in venture. These companies were getting started without, without designers anywhere in sight. Um, and like, oh my God, this is a big problem because these are all the healthcare companies that are building the software in the hospital. You know, it's like all the stuff that we use designers are absent. So it's a, there's a whole city getting built and architects are nowhere to be found. And I just thought, am I going to be okay? You know, and that was 2011, 2012. And I just thought to myself in 2022, which we're now here, I literally thought in 10 years, if I look back on this moment, will I feel good about staying at Facebook for another 10 years, knowing that this is what's happening outside these walls? And I just kind of sat with that for a few weeks. And I said, no, like, I, I'm not going to feel good about this. And I need to do something about this broader ecosystem. I need to start thinking about, you know, what, what's happening outside the castle, if you will. And at first I didn't, I thought it would be a side project. I didn't think I would actually like do it full time, but then it's like all of a sudden nights and weekends started being filled up with this thing. And, and that's the, that's one of the pieces of advice I always tell young designers is like, or actually people any, anywhere, like, what are you spending your nights and weekends on? And is there a way for you to make that your job? Mm -hmm. because that's, you know, that's the stuff that you're really into, right? If you're spending your nights and, you know, Saturdays and Sundays on something, 
And so is there a way for that to be your job? And so at Facebook, I had never had anything that wasn't Facebook be my nights and weekends thing. And around 2011 is when all of a sudden nights and weekends were designer fun time. And I thought to myself, what does this mean? Like, why, why am I not thinking about the next version of, you know, Facebook photo or like the next version of Facebook profile or what we could do, you know, why, like, why was I thinking about this? And, and I just realized like, because if, if we didn't do this thing, if we didn't do designer fun, like it didn't feel like there were any, there was anyone else that would do it. It kind of felt like that kind of thing. So that was why I left the, the sweet lovely cushiony <laughs> job there uh, the, the, sit, the blue yeah. walls or no no these are the spray painted walls the spray painted yeah. old walls <laughs> and by the way I, re- I remember uh when enrique and i were starting designer fund and, and uh one of our friends was, was letting us squat in the back of their um office for free uh surrounded by their like in storage container so it's like there's paper towel storage and toilet paper and cereal and whatever and that's where I watched like the Facebook IPO on, on uh, streaming. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, you're looking around and you're like, okay, what have I done? You know, yeah. I'm seeing my yeah. friends and, and confetti's raining down on them and bells are ringing and they're cheering and the, the whole thing. And it's on every news show and you're in the back of this, <laughs> this startup <laughs> surrounded by their like, you know, boxes of Captain Crunch and, and uh, Charms Ultra toilet paper you're like this might have been a mistake <laughs> yeah you went you went back and started a new story and you started it at ground level you to yeah build it from yeah there. yeah no one cares about what you're doing that's that's all i kept telling myself what you're doing right now no one cares about nobody it. literally nobody cares nobody you cares. and this other guy and that's it yeah there's maybe four of the people yeah I want to ask a couple of follow-up questions, um, and I'm going to kind of hit fast forward in a second and talk about kind of after the fund uh, was started and what fundraising was like. But I want to start first by talking about what you hoped to accomplish with Designer Fund. You know, you hit you hit on it there. You hit on an aspect of it, and I know there's a lot more to it, but you hit on an aspect of it a moment ago around making sure that design was there at, at day one when uh, you know engineers and founders are, are starting companies. Um, you know, one of the things I've observed is people that start companies come from every conceivable background. And, uh, you know, and yet at the end of the day, they need to ship a product that takes all these different disciplines, of which they might be good at one, maybe one. Um, uh, anyways, so talk a little bit about some of the ambitions that you had for Designer Fund and how those have played out in the last decade. Yeah, so at the highest level, it's based, and it hasn't really changed all that much, but it's basically the way we, the, the way we started is, we need better designed products and services in the world, right? You walk among you, you walk along your day, you know, you go to ATM, you go, you go order stuff online, you, um, you, you, you go travel somewhere, all these things that we do as, as people, we read news, whatever it is that we do. These are all experiences that are designed and a lot of them are poorly designed and, and, and and it's getting more and more frustrating. And there, there, there's, it, it's, getting harder and harder out there. And I'm, I, I think maybe we're just, as humans, we're just doing more things, right? It used to be just go to school, come back from school, eat dinner, right? <laughs> maybe take a walk. Um, and now we're just doing a lot more things as humans, a lot more things to do. And I think we use a lot more products and services. And, and those things are all designed and usually poorly. And so what we notice is we need to fix that. We need, we need better designed products and services in the world. And when you actually zoom out at what's required to do that, there's a lot of things that need to happen. We need way more designers in the world, like two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude, like a lot more, right? Then we need those designers to be um, good at at their job. You know, like we need them, we need qualified. You know, you don't, we don't just need a quantity, <laughs> we need quality, right? So we need high, people who can do the work really well. Then we need the people who, like you said, people are starting companies, they come from all sorts of backgrounds. Well, we need them to value design. And so they need to know that design is a superpower that can help your company win and do well. And without it, you're basically, you're hampered, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to be telling these stories of design creating successes. And if we don't do that, like people are not going to value it. They're not going to bring it into their company. Um, And then we need to make sure that the people who value it um, are also the companies that are going to do well, right? Um, and there, it's not always the case that, because design is one piece, you also need funding, you need good sales, you need good distribution, you know, all the things that 
that we know that make that make for a good company. And so, so when we looked at all those things, you know, it's like it's almost overwhelming when you first start with the mission. Is what we started with. It was just like, how do we get better design products and services in the world? And then we realized the venture ecosystem is responsible for so much of kind of creating the next generation of companies, right? And so, and design and designers. What we saw at the time was they were coming into these big, big companies and trying to like move, you know, push design and da da da. And and I remember um, there was a, a conference where it was uh, Brian Chesky was up on stage and there was the VP of design uh, uh, at, um, I think it was like at AT AT&T and the interviewer said, how do you get design a seat at the table at your company? And he's like, we'll start with you. And the VP of of design at AT&T had these like four pillars and, and how he communicated these four pillars and marketing within, within, it was a 15 minute answer of how, how he pushed design to, to have a seat at the table, um, at AT AT&T. And then he's like, Brian, what about you? How do you get designed a seat at the table at Airbnb? And Brian goes, well, because it's my fucking table. That's how. It's a great answer. Great answer. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. That's right. It's his fucking, it's, it's right. At Airbnb, of course, design is a seat at the table. The CEO, it's, it's, it's the, the CEO's table, right? Mm-hmm. And you see it in everything. And that moment, you know, it, it kind of like further cemented for me if you bring design in on the ground floor, it doesn't have to be a designer CEO, but it just has to be, ask anyone who, who's, who's been at Stripe for a long time. They understand the value of design because design is, is permeate. And those, you know, John and Patrick are not designers by background, but they value it. They, you know, one of the first hires they had was a designer and they made sure design was given time and space and resources to, to, to thrive at Stripe. And now you have all these people that worked at Stripe who, when they're starting companies, look at the stuff that Stripe employees have started since leaving Stripe. And all those products are beautifully designed. Why? Because they saw it firsthand that great design creates success, right? And so for us, it's like, we need a thousand X that. And 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 to do that, it, it's much, we felt like if you were going to look out 15, 20 years, the way to do that is not to try to send hundreds of designers to Ford and uh, cost, you know, like these huge companies and try to like build, bake it into the, bake it in after the fact. It's who's going to build the next set of Fortune 500 companies and how do we make sure that design is, is there on the ground floor? So it's like, okay, well, who's making those next, the next generation? It's VCs. How many VCs value design? One, three, five, I don't know, whatever it was in 2012, you could probably count it on one hand. And we just said, okay, well, that's where we go. That's, that's where we're needed. We need, we need to insert ourselves into that and change the ecosystem that way. How has it gone? Well, I would say like, um, some things have gone really well in that, like, we do see companies that value design really succeed. Um, we do see more investors value design. We do see, uh, design taken more seriously. I mean, even just something as simple as when I started a designer made, I don't know, 70% of what engineers made. If you're a graphic designer, a, a print, you know, if you were like a marketing designer, you were, you made half of what an engineer made, maybe even less, right? I, I think it wasn't uncommon for a, a graphic designer to make like 60, 70 K and an engineer make two, two, 200 K, right. Or whatever it was. And now designers and engineers often are paid the same. And so that's gone really well. Now I also expected, uh, by year 10, if you were to tell me what does success look like for you, it's like, Oh, every company we talk to has a designer founder at this point. Right. No. And the reality, and I, I mean, designer fund. So designer fund, it's like, <laughs> it's like, if you're going to designer fund, you have a designer founder, right? And there's, and there should be hundreds or thousands of these kinds of companies with designers on the founding team. That hasn't happened. Um, and I think a big part of that is simply, we just don't output enough designers still. There just simply aren't, you know, the design schools and the, the demand has grown. But like, I remember a few years ago, I was looking at um, how many students uh, someone at Facebook told me, Hey, did you know Facebook's trying to hire about 500 designers right now? And I started doing the math. I'm like, wait a second, take the top, like 10 design schools. If literally every graduating senior from the top 10 design schools was going to go to Facebook, that's still not 500 designers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Hey, you know how many Google is trying to hire another 500, you know, how many IBM is trying to hire 1200, you know? And, and then you're like, all that doesn't work. <laughs> There's not enough of us. Like, right? It just doesn't work. 
And so there's simply not enough designers um, to have made the math work, to have enough designers be co-founders and all that stuff. And then the second thing I think is I was hoping to see more designers, designer investors, right? It's like, hey, if designer funds are successful, like other designers should be like, we can do that. And there have been a few. I mean, you're one, right? And um, there have been a few others, but like, I'm like, why aren't there 500 designer investors? And I think the more I'm into it, the more I get into being a, a, a VC, the more I realize that they're very different. Being a designer and being an investor is very different. Um, and it's and and it isn't as different for engineers. And it's way you know the overlap of what it takes to be a good engineer and a good VC is probably there's a lot more overlap. And then the overlap of what it takes to be like a good at business and a good VC is like almost 100. You know, it's just a circle, right? <laughs> yeah. It's just like one circle, yeah. Um, in terms of like the love of the work, and you know, so for me, I get it. Why a design? It's like, hey, designer, do you want to look at spreadsheets all day instead of? Uh, hang out in Figma making cool shit? No. Right. Of course not. Why would you? That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense that you don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm just much more um, realistic now that it's going to be much harder to get designers to be investors. But I do think we can get more investors to really understand the power of design. And I think we can do a lot more to, to, to uh, support the designer angel ecosystem, which is that's where I'm starting to realize that's where we can get the 100,000x because designers are actually eager and excited to be angels because it's it's less of a commitment financially. It's less of a commitment time-wise and it lets them spend most of their time still being a designer while kind of scratching the itch of, of being a consultant and having more breadth of work. So I think that's a place where every one of us can be, um, th that's where we can create some real change. So I would say like, you know, a lot of, you know, where are, in terms of like, where are we 10 years after we started? I think like there's a lot of things that have worked well. Designers Fund is successful. Our funds are doing well. We do see more design, but like there are definitely things that have not played out the way I, if you had given me a magic wand in 2012, that like I would have, I would have wanted like a, a designer partner at every firm and that's not even close. Yeah. No, not even close. <laughs> I'd love to stop, stop for a second and and kind of demystify design. And and what I'm what I want to do here for a second is one of the thoughts I've often had, uh, which I don't love, but I think there's a lot of truth in it, is that design for a lot of people is a dark art. And what I mean by that is they don't really know what what it is or, or what it means. And and what I mean by that, just to give you a couple examples, you know, I uh, and I know you and I have both had experiences doing this. You know, I know from experience, design is incredibly powerful at crafting a company's brand. And, and why is that the case? Because inevitably, a company has a point of view, they have a future they're trying to create, they have values, we need to figure out how to express that. And it turns out expressing that visually is, and it's not just visually, it's, in, you know, visually, and then in copy, bringing yeah. it all together is really, really, really hard. That's one aspect. Yeah. Then there's marketing, then there's product design, then there's, you know, all of these different pieces. So I guess that just the question I would ask is, do you ever break apart what design is and how do you maybe demystify it for founders or people that are like, what is design with a capital D and what are all the different places you can apply it to? Yeah, I would say, look, we have, we have a much broader, and by the way, like when we were, <laughs> when we were fundraising for our first fund, you know, there were definitely people who were like 10 minutes into the pitch, they'd sit back and they go, can I just stop you for a second? What is design? Yes. This, this is for those people. <laughs> and we're like, what There's do a lot you of mean? Them. And they're like, they're like, is it like interior design? Is it like, what do you, you know, I'm like, uh-oh. You know, so like I, I would know in those pitches, like, oh, well, we need to back way, 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 way up. Yeah. So the, the, way, the way we think about um, design at Designer Fund is pretty broad, right? So there are the different like types of, that you have marketing design, you have, UI UX design, you have product design, which is strategic. Um, but even like before, so those are usually the types of, um, and then you have graphic design, which is, which is part of, which can be marketing design, but you know, it doesn't have to be. There's like, there's different, different um, ways to apply graphic design. And so I think at the highest level, like, yeah, design is the deliberate act of making something, right? And it's the deliberate act of making something with a purpose. Right. So it, there's some supposed to be some utility when you're designing something. 
Uh, if it doesn't have utility, if it's for creative expression, that tends to be art. So that's at the highest level what design is. When it comes to startups, the way it gets manifested is marketing design, product design, uh, UI, UX design, which is like the design of like the, the, the components of, of the software that we use. And then how it gets manifested at companies, I, I think the, the challenge for a lot of designers is to make people understand. Um, and then, sorry, and then there's also like experience design which is both offline and online. Um, and so, so I think the, uh, the thing that is a challenge for designers at, at tech companies and companies in general is to help people understand that everything that we do, everything that we experience is designed. And whether, de- whether like you realize it or not, yeah. right? You, you've, um, you've created, you know, we, we're always creating things that people are experiencing and, and and um, most people don't think about it as design. They just think of it as like doing work or whatever, making things. But it, it's all design, right? And so I, I like to have design be a much broader tent um, as opposed to this thing that does, it's like, hey, you can't design things because you're not a designer. It's like everyone is a designer, honestly. Like everyone is a designer, whether they know it or not. Okay, so let's start with that now. So now that you know that you're designing things all the time, all of us are, well, then the question becomes, are you doing it well or not? So it's not, should this thing be designed? Do we need designers? It's how well do we want the thing designed? Mm-hmm. Do we want it done poorly? Then, you know, so I'll, let me give you another example. So um, when I spoke to sales at Facebook early on, there was one guy in sales and I said, hey, what would you do with design resources? And he goes, well, let me show you what I'm going to go pitch Microsoft with. And he pulls a PowerPoint, right? And we were a small company at the time. And the idea was, Hey, let's let's show Microsoft what it would look like to integrate Microsoft products into Facebook, hmm. as 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 done by a sales person using PowerPoint, right? Which makes me frightened at what that would look like. <laughs> and it's and, and it's whatever you're envisioning is, is not as good as what it was, right? Um, and and so I think and and you know what to, to this guy's credit, like it, to his credit, like it, you know do the best that you can with the tools available, right? But his his but the insight, he's like, look, you're a product designer. You can absolutely, you're, oh, you're designing the very product that these things could be manifest, you know, like what would Microsoft Maps look like within Facebook? What would Microsoft Ads look like within Facebook? You could actually make this look real, right? Um, and so I was like, all right, let's do it. Like, I'll do it. Like, I'll love to work together. And all of a sudden, the sales deck became one of this, like, imagine, you know, it's like one of storytelling and squinting your eyes to one where they could actually, it's like, hey, look, this is it. This is mm-hmm. what the final deliverable could be. And, and this is what millions of people would see exactly like this. And that's super powerful, right? And so for me, like um, using design, you know, so, so I think that that's where I try to tell people is like, you can, we're always designing things. And the question is, are you designing it well or not? Um, and if it's not being designed well, well, then you need to be thinking about like, how do I bring in, create design into all the things that our company's doing so that they can have the impact that we want. I'd love to talk for a second about designer founders. Um, and I know a designer fund, it's not like every founder that comes to you or every founder you write a check-in needs to have a design background. But clearly, they're coming to you. They care about design. They want to get design uh, right. But I want to zoom in for a second on the people that come to you and do have a design background and are a designer founder. And I guess the question I want to ask there is, you talked before about this Venn diagram of, you know, and it was more design versus VC. But it strikes me that design and founder Venn diagram is probably pretty decoupled as, as well, too. And so one of the questions yes. I wanted to ask is, you know, I, I think any for, if anyone listening thinks about, well, what, what advantages would a founder have if they have a design background? They can come up with probably some pretty compelling answers. But yeah. what I think is interesting as well, too, is what do they struggle with? So can you talk for a second about when you, when you end up investing in a designer founder, what do they typically get right and what do they typically struggle with and you have to help them? I don't know that there's a typical, uh, yeah, I can stereotype a little bit, but I would say that from what I've seen, designer founders are as broad of a set of people as kind of founders. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is like, you know, you have the, the designer founders that are super into craft. You have the designer founders that are, that are actually like really into business building and want to use design as, as, as kind of like a superpower in, in building a business. And they actually see business building as a design endeavor. 
you have designers, des- designer founders who basically are like, I'm done with design and I just want to build a company. And like, mm-hmm. I don't even, yeah. or, or even there's even a more extreme, which is someone who, who just thinks design is shit. Like I was a designer. I spent all my time massaging rounded corners and, 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 and that's crap. And I'm over that. And I don't even believe, I don't, they, they, they've kind of like, uh, rebelled against it in some ways. So I would say there's, there's a, there's a, there's a huge swath of people when, even within the designer founder ecosystem. So when we got started a designer fund, our thinking was, how do we invest in companies that value design? And the easiest way to do that is by using the filters. Do they have a designer on the founding team? Um, and it was a pretty good filter, but what I would say is, that there were a lot of founders that came to us in those early days and the Stripe founders are, are in that bucket where they said, look, okay, I'm not a designer founder, but just look at my actions, look at where I've put resources into it, it look at what I've uh, brought resources into. And it's very clear that they value design. And in some, in some cases, founders who value design that are not designers have actually done a better job of resourcing design than designer founders because I think they have they have the ability of saying you know I am not a designer and I think it's really important and so it almost comes off as more it's it's less uh, self serving if you will right if I'm an engineer that super values design and I'm the CEO of the company everyone's like wow okay well if that person thinks design is valuable you know, and it's it's not like they're just like playing to their own thing um, it must be important right and so. Over time, we've much more um, decided, we, we've come to the conclusion that it's more about investing in founders that value design. Mm-hmm. And they can be designers, but they don't necessarily have to be. Uh, and in terms of uh, what are the mistakes, if I had to generalize like the things that they're strong at and the things that they're, they're weak at, designer founders are amazing at manifesting the future because they can basically create something that looks built and real. They can build this brand, they can build a marketing site, they can build a product before it's, it's shipped so that they can basically, instead of telling you with words, they build the thing, right? And you just say, wow, this is, I can see what you mean when you're pitching me on something because it looks like it's built, right? So that's a huge superpower. They're amazing at storytelling. So brand building, product building, storytelling, those are all strengths. I would say where most most designer, where a lot of designer founders can be weak is all, it's like, there's all sorts, there's like dozens of things you need to be good at as, as a founder, sales, uh, fundraising, which is related to sales, uh, hiring and recruiting, um, you know, setting business, you know, like, uh, financial projections, all those things. So I think what we talk to designer founders about, and actually, you know, we tell almost every founder, this is like, what are the things that you're good at that you're going to lean into? What are the things that you're not gonna that you're not good at, but you want to get good at? And let's figure those out. And what are the things that you're not good at that you don't want to be good at that we need to outsource or get someone in here who's who's going to take those off your plate? And so we definitely look a lot at the composition of a founding team and making sure that we have kind of that balance that, that the key pieces are somehow covered by the founding team and potentially also by the investing team. And so for designer founders, it often means that they have someone who's a domain expert or someone who's an engineer or someone who's uh, really good at operations. It tends to be that designers don't love those kind of things. Designers tend to focus on brand, product. uh, You know, I'll just say brand and product tend to be the things that designers focus on most. I want to ask kind of a springboard question, and it's related to that. And one of the questions I want to ask, you know, you, uh, I can't remember how many companies you've invested in now, but it's quite a few. It's over in the, 50. It's in the tens for sure, over 50. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a lot of data points. And, and one of the things I've observed is that getting design right in a company is actually very challenging because one, there's just the super high level, you say you care about design, but when push comes to, so- comes to shove and you're in a budget conversation, that's a heated discussion around yeah. where resources are going to go. You, yeah. you can't pull the trigger on allocating towards design. That's maybe the easy one. But then there's a lot of stuff I've seen where somebody actually wants to be good at design, but there's a lot of soft stuff that's necessary for design to function well in your company. And one example there, I'll just give an example, is uh, one of the things I noticed uh, and I've observed kind of broadly is leaving time for exploration before you get into just execution. We talked about this before, but you know, talking with someone around, hey, I'd like this to be done in four weeks. 
Uh, and that, sure, maybe you can get that done if it's a straight shot. But oftentimes with design, you're trying to get to an ideal outcome. And that actually takes a lot of exploration. And what is exploration? It's throwing work out. So one of the questions I wanted to ask is just, what have you observed about the companies that get design right and the companies that get design wrong? And that could be from self-inflicted wounds, just from things that they maybe don't know that they're getting it wrong. What have you observed there? Do you have anything interesting to share? Yeah, I would say like, uh, we, and we had this mantra at Facebook, which was sweat the details that matter. Um, and you're like, well, what does that, what does that mean? And it's like, depending on the stage, depending on the, the resources available, spend your time and use design to create the outcomes that are needed at that time. So here, here's an example. So I was talking to this designer who was trying to get, um, trying to get the CEO to give them resources to spend more time on a UI system, okay? And so that's a, that's a good example where like a lot of designers are trying to build good UI systems. And this person was like, I just can't get the CEO to, to take the time to just look at the V1 and, and I, I wanna get it really good so that the product's really good. I said, okay, why? Why, why doesn't the CEO have time? And he goes, well, he's just out there fundraising a bunch right now. I said, oh, well, what, you know, what's going on with the fundraising? He's like, well, you know, we're a couple months away from running out of money. So that's where his head's at. I said, wait a second. Your CEO, you're two months from running out of money. Your CEO is running around trying to fundraise and you're, you're fucking talking about a UI system. It's a good point. It's a good point. What are you even doing? What are you doing? You're a designer. Okay. This guy's out there trying to sell and raise money for the company. That's the air and water you need to breathe. If you don't have that, there's no UI system. The UI system is irrelevant. That's why he's not making the time for it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the deck looks like that he's going out there? Just no. Why not? You're an amazing visual designer. Go look at that deck and see if you can fucking help. Do you know people who could invest in the in the company? Maybe. I don't, does it, if do you know one or two people? Go get, go find those people. Right. So it's like, I think the 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 companies that do design well, they basically understand. What are the what are the important needs of the company right now, and how can I apply design to those needs? And it's so basic, but you actually see a lot of people doing this wrong, which is like you know the company needs to find product market fit, and you have designers like polishing uh, a marketing site, for example, or or um, polish, polishing a product that is that they don't even know is the right thing to build. So actually, what they should be doing is designing five or six things and testing them regularly, right? They should be testing every week. Uh, so I, I think that's that's the thing that I, I have no, and, and it might seem very obvious, but it's basically there's a lot of people that apply resources to things that are not important at that time in that, in that stage of the company because they think it's just like, it's the right thing to do. This thing, need, you know, it's like, we need a good brand. Do you? Like, do you need that brand right now? You know, we need a good UI system. Do you right now? You don't even know if this is the right product to build. You might not even need buttons. You know, maybe it's like all audio based. <laughs> maybe it's all AI. Maybe it's, you know, it's like, so I think that's the thing to me that um, I see the product, uh, the, the people that do it well, they, they know when to go deep and, and polish, polish the thing and when to not do that. No, it's so well said. It makes me think of, uh, you know, I remember when I was at Square, we had uh, someone on the team who was incredibly passionate that it was finally time for us to come up with a style guide and this like brand book. And, uh, you know, for anyone listening, it's a designer, this is a somewhat of a contentious topic. Like, do we codify what we do and kind of put, you know, paint ourselves into a box? Do we keep it open ended? But it was a great example of, you know, looking back, it was just such a terrible idea. And I should have been much more vocal <laughs> about not doing it. And, and the reason was exactly to your point. It's not that it wasn't useful. Uh, and I have my own thoughts, you know, that I won't get into necessarily around, you know, the kind of utility of it when it's useful. But it was exactly what you were talking about. There was better things that we could have been doing. And it was just kind of, you know, not, I think, not wrestling and grappling with enough that the tension that exists in the business at any given moment of what actually needs to get done. Um, so I love that point. I, I would love to talk for a second um, to kind of switch. So we talked a lot about design, love to switch for a second and talk about investing. And one of the questions I want to ask there, and this may be a um, overly clever way of asking the question. But you know, if you were to think about how designer fund makes investment decisions, as an algorithm, let's call it the designer fund algorithm, what does yeah. that look like? And what's your general process and approach to making investment decisions? 
Yeah. So we, we actually, uh, uh, you know, I talked to you about designing venture. And so one of the things that we noticed is that yeah, a, lot, a lot of that, there are investors that shoot from the hip. They just like, they meet a founder, they get a gut reaction and they just invest that way. Um, and so we're not that way. I think we really want to systematize and productize our investment process. So we actually have a, a kind of a template of what are the things that we ask companies? What do we want to see? Um, and making sure that companies, uh, you know, meet the bar in all the different things, you know, what's the product? Are these going to, are they going to build the best in class product? Is there something around go to market here that do we have any signals around traction? So we probably have, um, an approach that is similar to a lot of other funds. The different, I I think the two difference, one is that we try to apply a very, um, structured process to everything that we do to make sure that we can go back and say, why did we make that decision? And was it the right or wrong decision? Not just like, well, I met that person. They seemed fun at the time. Um, so good process, good, you know, we want to see good process, good outcomes. And then I think that the, the other layer that the lens that we add that most firms don't add is probably this design layer, which is, is design going to have a meaningful impact on the outcome of this company? And there are, there are certain companies, whether it's like a science project, right? It's like, Hey, we're trying to like, uh, let's you know, lab grown meat, right? It's like, um, you know, I don't know that this, if, if you can't get this burger to be less than a hundred, a hundred dollars a burger, um, there's very little design I can apply to this company to make that work. Right. And so certain things like that, where there's a fundamental science thing, like design is, it can have some impact, but I, I think it's very tough for us to say that design is going to be, uh, instrumental in the success of the company. So we want to see design be able to play a, a role in the success of the company. And then the other filter we have is impact, which is like, does this a company actually move the world in the direction that we want to see? So there are companies like that we see that, you know, I remember back in the day, I saw a company that was like LCD screen ads on top of cars and they're geolocated. So it's like, okay, if you're in Soma, you'll see an ad for a restaurant in Soma. Sounds really neat and like probably can make money, but it's like, people are already distracted enough as it is. And so do we <laughs> want like moving lit billboards on top of cards i certainly don't the society like i don't think we need that i don't think we want that and i think ultimately like it might be pretty negative you know it might negatively impact and so for us we actually also add a filter of like is this actually moving the world in the direction that we want to see the world move because and and i you know we we do it just from a intrinsic like we want to have the impact we want but well there's also a greedy reason to do that which is employees are going to ask that question too. The best people are going to ask like, is this company doing good in the world? And if not, like, why would I work there? And we see this all the time. Like when I go to designers and I say, what, what spaces do you want to work in? You know, 99 out of 100 will say, if there's something in climate right now, they, they're, they're down to work on that. It's a really exciting area. And re- yeah, right. It's like, it's what's needed and it's going to move the world in a positive direction. If you tell them, uh, how many of you want to work in like marketing tech, you know, mark tech and like, you know, one out of, yeah, zero out of a hundred, <laughs> one out of a hundred. It's really fucking hard to hire if you're building like a new way to do ads, you know, whatever, ad algorithm. Because a lot of designers just, that, that's not the thing that gets them up at, up uh, in, in, the, in the morning. And so to us, I just think like we, we're going to, we want to have the impact, the positive impact. And I think that that's going to yield a, a better performing fund long term. I, I want to ask another question, you know, as I was thinking about this interview, one of the things that came to mind is, um, you know, as a designer, you talked about this before, like, it, you know, in the areas where a designer founder uh, just spikes really hard, the areas where they're kind of off, off, off the charts good, is generally around having a very strong vision of what they want to build, being able to bring that to life and being able to kind of understand and tell a story around that. And one way of thinking about that is, you can see the potential in something. And I, I see this in a lot of designers I've worked with. You, you know, designers have this way of you can dream. show them something that's very half-baked. Yeah, and they can, yes, they can yes, dream. Yes. Or, I, feel, you know, I maybe, fill in the holes. I can fill in the holes with <laughs> yeah, the best you can, stuff too. Yeah, yeah, you can see the potentiality. And so one of the questions I want to ask was, when you're making investment decisions, how much in your mind are you making that decision on what exists today? And how much in your mind are you making that decision on the potentiality and where you think this can go? This, this is so hard. You know, this is, this is, this is one of the hardest like shifts I think I've had because 
as as a designer in every job I've had before being an investor, when someone comes to me with like, hey, here's an idea I have. And in my head, I'm like, yes, that's an amazing idea. And here's here's how with design, we will make this global, amazing, impactful, right? I can already see like it could work like this and it could work like this and we can do this and da, da, da. And so you you have, or at least for me, I have this positive, I'm inclined to think, dream big and, and think the uh, positive outcomes and, and see this thing manifested into like all its glory, right? Well, guess what? Like as an investor, you're not the designer on the thing. Like at best, you're like a coach. You can guide, you can help recruit, um, but you can't design the thing. And so I think, um, so we do two things. First, we say, okay, you want to build company X. Let's dream to get. So one of the things I tell founders is let's dream together, you and I right now. It's five years from now. So right now, August 18th, it's 2022. It's August 18th, 2027. Daniel, like, what does the thing that you're building look like that is that is meeting every one of your wildest dreams? What does the product do? What what you know, uh, what are the people that it impacts? Like all that stuff. Let's dream together. Um, and and that's like an exercise. Let's just like do that together. Uh, and then I kind of think, okay, like given that's where you want to go and the team that's in place right now, how, <laughs> you know, how do we feel about that Delta? Yeah. Right. And, and what needs to happen to make that dream a reality? That's where you crush their dream then. If that's well, that, second question. That's, <laughs> that, yeah, that is, that is where I'm like, well, you need a designer at least, or, or at least 50 for what you want to do. So I think that's, um, that's something that as an investor, I've had to, kind of temper a little bit of this like uh yes and a little bit and you have to have a little bit of like a little bit of skeptic um skepticism and and honestly I don't know like I think um we'll see long term it's tough because like it's easy to like be like well this one you know I've seen seven companies that you know it's like well when Facebook was was raising money like there were 30 you know social networks that were around at the time and there's a good reason to say like that'll never work Mm -hmm. Right. And guess what? It did work. Right. So, um, so I think I'm trying to temper, like find the right balance of let's dream together. Um, and let's think about what could this be if, it, if everything goes right. Um, but then also kind of temper it with like realistically, like, does that vision fit what the founder, you know, the, with the skill sets of the founding team and kind of like their ability to execute and, and all that good stuff. So that's that's a that's a shift that I've had to happen, but it, it's definitely hard because as a designer, you just want to work on all the things and make them all like manifest into this to the their like best selves. Well, totally. I think it's you know what? Yeah, just put a point on it. I feel like as a designer, you can extrapolate out from where this is and come up with this really appealing, really exciting vision. And it's easy to just be like, that's it. I'm going to invest on that. So it's good, great to hear you talk about that struggle because, um, oh man, do I struggle with that? And so it's good. And, and, and it's also, does your dream, you want to make sure that does your dream match what they're dreaming? Yeah. You know, you're like, oh yeah, and it could be this and this and this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I guess so. And you're like, whoa, whoa wait a second. What did I said, what I just said, is, is that what you want to build or is it yeah. something else? Yeah, because if it's something else, like we need to talk about that, right? So yeah. I think like you want to make sure that you're helping them get to their, you know, the thing that they're going to work on their own, and not not pushing your own agenda because ultimately then that's going to be the tension where you're like, man, I was really yeah. hoping you'd build X, and, and, and your agenda doesn't one. matter. Your agenda doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> the end of the day. Yeah. So uh, you know, this is uh, one of this has been one of my favorite interviews in a long time. And, you know, it's just another way of saying I could ask you, I would love to ask you 50 more questions. Um, so I'd have to be a little bit choosy about how we're going to wrap up. And, uh, you know, leading up to this interview, I asked the designer fund community, you guys have done an amazing job of getting hundreds of designers um, all around the world that love design, you know, as part of the designer fund community, I asked them what questions they would love to hear you cover. And I've picked two that I'd love to talk about really quickly. One <laughs> is from Mish Lin. And the question is, designer fund is obviously uh, invested in a ton of fantastic companies. As a unique and truly design-centric venture partner, what are the core qualities and values that you look for in startups and builders? In startups and builders? Well, we, we talked a little bit about this, but basically, like, are they impacting one of our core areas of impact, right? So it's healthcare, uh, sustainability, prosperity. 
Um, does the founding team demonstrate that they value design? Have they invested in design? Are they showing that they can build the best in class product? And then, and then the, the rest of it is very similar to other, you know, is there any signals of traction? Uh, um, do they have a well-rounded team that has both like domain expertise, um, great engineering, great product and, um, and great operational excellence also is something we look at now. Um, we look at like, has the founding team worked together before and has shown the ability to like, you know, collaborate in the heat of, of things and, and build things together before. Cause I think that's something that's un- undervalued a lot. Um, yeah, I would say like those, those are kind of the key. There, there's a bunch of other stuff, but those, those are maybe like the key. It's like product team, um, and, and space slash impact areas that they're focused on. Yeah, that's the 80-20. Uh, yeah. Second question, last question uh, from the Designer Fund community is from John Farrigan. And uh, this one's a little bit different. You know, you talked about at the beginning that if Designer Fund was successful, you hope to see a wave of, uh, you know, venture funds focused around design, but also design angels. And another thing that's, uh, you know, a lot of designers are really interested in is being a design advisor. So this question comes a little bit from that angle. And the question is, what has stood out to you as the most impactful ways designers can add value to early stage companies as advisory angel investors? Yeah, so as, as advisors, you are, you don't have that much time, right? So you have very limited time. So it's typically the best thing as an advisor that you can do, and that's what we try to do, is basically teach them how to fish. So I would say, like, don't try to be their designer. So if they're like, hey, I'm struggling with this marketing site, I'll just do it, give me like six hours. Because then like, once you're done, then what, right? So I think the best thing you can do is like, find them, find them great people to work, you know, great designers they can work with, great freelancers they can work with, great um, agencies they can work with help them hire amazing talent. I mean, that's one of the most valuable things a designer or advisor can do is like actually help them hire that first hire. They can also make sure that that first hire has a good experience. I mean, that's a big part of what we do is like once you hire that first designer, well, now they're like sole, solo designer, lonely person at the company, right? Fighting the good fight. <clears throat> well, if designer funds are on the table, at least that person knows that they're supported by you know dozens uh, of great designers that they can access. So. I would say that's where the leverage is, is in teaching them, is getting them the, res- the right resources and, and making sure that those resources are doing the good work versus actually doing the design work, which mm-hmm. I think a lot of designers sort of want. That's what they sort of want. They're like, yeah, hey, it's almost like freelancing a little bit and I get equity for doing some design. Um, and I think that there's some value in that, but I think like ultimately you're, you're better off actually um, not giving them the fish, but actually like giving them the tools to, yeah. to fish on their own. Yeah. Don't just solve the current pain, but help them be able to solve those problems well into the future. It goes back to that process point you made earlier. And it's super hard because you know you could spend 20, 30 hours recruiting and have nothing to show for it. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, oh, I guess I haven't done anything. But the reality is like, once you help them hire that person, all of a sudden it's like, that person's going to be working eight to 10 hours a day. You know, within within a week, they'll have already done more work than if you're spending whatever, let's say even two hours a week, right? So that person in in one week, right, is gonna is gonna outpace you, you know, spending you know we months and months on this problem. So I think like people don't realize just like how impactful recruiting is. And by the way, for any designer listening, you should be spending a lot of time recruiting for your company. Like it's it's another thing that a lot of designers don't spend enough time recruiting other designers. Um, but it's a really impactful thing to do because once you get another designer in there early on, it has a huge impact on the output of the team. I could, you know, continue to ask you questions. I would love to ask you questions for another hour, um, but it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much for the time, Ben. This has been incredible. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and text transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 131. That's outlieracademy.com slash 131. And you can learn more about Designer Fund at designerfund.com or by following Designer Fund on Twitter. At outlieracademy.com, you can find all of our other investor interviews profiling investment firms, including Dreehouse Capital, NFX, Graycroft, Pantera Capital, Compound Kings, Foundation Capital, Moran Capital Management, and many, many more. In every interview, we deconstruct the ideas, frameworks, and strategies they used to generate incredible returns and track records. 
You can find videos of all of our interviews on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlier academy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full length interviews as well as our favorite short clips from every episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe. We post new videos and clips every single week. And if you haven't already, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn at outlier academy. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode next Wednesday.